This is Ripe, a pop band from Boston, now based in Los Angeles. And here is frontman Robbie Wolfson to tell us about their new album, Bright Blues. But first, we need to talk about hair. So I'm not sure if it's now or it's never, or it's never, if it's never been done before. Man, it's quite a head of hair you got there. I appreciate you. It keeps on growing. I don't know what to do with it. Uh, can you hand, lend a butt guy a, you know, <laughs> some <laughs> I say this to everyone that asks. If you figure out the technology, I like you fine. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Has it always been like that? Um, it was shorter than this, and then it grew to longer. I started growing it long, probably like the second or third year the band existed. Right. Uh, I honestly had gotten, I had ha like hair stylists that always like to buzz the sides and keep the top kind of flush. Right. And to me, it looked like Marge Simpson. I was over it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, After if that's the look you're looking for, I guess that's it. But yeah, I'm open to being styled down the line now that I've seen it grow long. Like whenever this comes off, it'll have to be with intent or my bandmates will kill me. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, for now, it's like it's nice to let it rage. It's nice to have something a little out of control be well received. Yep, absolutely. So uh, and that's kind of a good attitude for a band as well, isn't it? <laughs> that is certainly the hope. So, so tell me about Ripe. You got your your second album coming out on. Well, it just came out. Actually, it's been out for yeah. A couple it came of years out. Now. So this is the difficulty <laughs> of coordinating the times. Yes, 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 indeed. Uh, so before we get into the nuts and bolts of the record, just tell me about the band. What what is your vision? How do you explain the band to folks? The sound, the the vibe. Usually depends how invested in the genre conversation I am, and also how long I have to explain. <laughs> uh, I think that the music that we've been making for the longest time, it deals in kind of catharsis. I think that's why even when the music doesn't necessarily sound like dance music on the record, it's always a dance show. Uh -huh. um, and I think that we kind of all come from different genre backgrounds, but always coming from the place of like, what is it about this music that gets people to get vulnerable in a space to sort of find community and look to other people as like being in common with them in that space. Uh, and also, you know, life is not an easy thing, especially as you get older and older. Uh, and as the world gets older and older. So I think that we're trying to be as honest as possible and being like, this is not an easy thing to get through, but sort of the arts and performance art and music, even more specifically than that, seems to be a place where people can come together and air those things out. Uh, and if you're lucky, even kind of engage in a sort of alchemy where the very fact that you're airing out difficult things allows you to tap into sort of a higher level of enjoyment. Uh -huh. um, and it's a lot of words when we could just say, you know, dance pop or like pop rock <laughs> or rock band with horns. Yep. But I do think that like that's the goal of what we're doing as close as we can to nailing it down. Right. Uh, we want people to leave the show a little bit more elated and a little bit ready to go back into the trenches and do battle with whatever they're doing battle with. Gotcha. Gotcha. And uh, you mentioned the, the horns there. So that is kind of what separates you from your basic rock band, pop band guitar bass keyboards that kind of thing why do you feel that having a trombone player and uh, the occasional trumpet player or whatever is important for the sound of the band i mean have you heard the guys they're great you yeah. know but I, I think that like a lot of the genres that we pull from that aren't pure rock because of course a lot of us do draw a lot of our childhood influences from the sort of rock canon as it existed right um i've been from music where horns have played a vital role whether that's through the expressiveness of jazz or the sort of kinetic energy of you know most iterations of funk bands, like using that instrumentation to kind of elevate what's going on and give another set of voices on stage uh, has always been really appealing to us. Also, they're my close friends. Ah, well, there you go. Even better. Yeah. Now, are you, so you're based in Boston, right? Uh, we actually are recently transplanted to Los Angeles, but we spent 11 years in Boston. The band formed in Boston. To anyone who asks, I still say that we're a Boston band, but we are Californian residents right now. That's a big move. Yes, it is daunting as heck, but we're riding it as best we can. <laughs> so, and why did you? Is it, was it business reasons that you moved across, or what? It must be. I feel like it's it's always weird to say business reasons when we mean creative reasons. Like, okay, obviously, sure. the band is it's also a business, but we were working. The record that just came out was produced with two friends that lived out in Los Angeles, and uh, they were involved in the writing process as well. And like, they were close friends that sort of guided us through our first rodeo in that kind of space right um and it's really apparent to us that there's just there's so many musicians here there are so many different ideas of what is awesome creatively uh and we wanted to sort of immerse ourselves in a, a flow that had a lot of people try to answer that question uh boston has been amazing and informative for us uh and also a lot of our musical community has left over time 
because uh, it's a difficult place to sort of set up shop for your entire life. Gotcha. Uh, and so we were just at a point where a lot of the people that we wanted to be making music beside day in and day out when we weren't on the road were out in California and eventually it built enough pressure that we took the leap of faith. All right. So so the new album is Bright Blues. You touched briefly on the guys that helped you make it out there. So tell me when the album started to come together for you. When did you start going, hey, we're we're working on number two here? Um, I think that we've been trying to work on number two basically since the close of number one. Right. But I think that we knew that we wanted to create a body of work that really led into like a next chapter feeling thing when we wanted to call it an album. So the first song that was written was a little bit by accident. We booked a trip to get a few of the guys out with these producers to see how things felt comfort wise uh, in, I believe, August of 2019. And that yielded what would turn out to be the first songs on this record. Um, and that was kind of the genesis point of, oh, OK, like not only do these guys work as sort of writers because we'd had them involved in the writing of some of the singles that preceded this record, um, but also it felt really good to entrust them in sort of the captain's chair of producing the record with us. Right. Um, and there was sort of some initial immediate, like obvious spark where it was like, oh, this is yielding something that like at that sort of sub like rational, like sub brainy level, it's just connecting with everyone in the gut in the room as we make it. Um, and it sort of felt like maybe obvious isn't the right word, but it felt apparent that this was the means we had to follow. It was just feeling really good for everybody from the second it was starting to get made. Right. So what was the first song that you wrote that got it kicked off? First song was Settling, which turned out to be the first Settling. single, which turned out to be one of the songs that we feel yep. carries the record. For sure. We never think to get better, to get better, to get better, but you're not sure. Yeah, and of course now that was back in 2019. World's a kind of a different place now. <laughs> that was, seems like a, a lifetime ago. That has all that stuff that's happened in the interim affected how this record was put together? I mean, I could try and say no and see who laughs first. Right, right. Um, <laughs> no, I would say that in a way that now feels very positive and hopefully will inform the rest of the music we make forever and ever. Amen. Like because of the time from initial genesis to finishing of the record. And then even the time from finishing up the record to starting to play the songs live to putting the record out, there's now like multiple layers of meaning, even as the people that made this music, you know, a lot of songs that were very much about one thing when they were initially written are now about three things simultaneously. Right. And at least for me, like that's exciting music to be trying to perform and trying to evoke for like 10 years, 20 years, as long as we get to play this music. And so for me, of course, it is now locked in there, but as is the stuff that precedes it, which is selfishly kind of nice for me that like the good old days also have a home in this record. Right. Um, and then also sort of the world re-engages with itself. Um, a lot of that stuff has already started to imprint the music just because we've been playing it live in a bunch of very strange circumstances up to the release of this record and the ensuing tour. Right, right. Now, uh, is uh, one track I wanted to talk about was Queen of the City because uh, songwriting wise, I'm, I'm guessing there's some kind of story behind that song. Is there? Met her in line 8:45 before the show. I hear she kinda runs the town, so I'm told. She spent the night showing me things I didn't know. I'm starting to get the picture. I'm starting to get the picture. There is. Um... I'm deciding which parts of it I want to tell. I will. Yeah, fair I'm enough. That's, that's up no, to no you. Worries. I would say that the the whole song, as it's written, sits in kind of a like internally confused place where, like, even as we were writing it, like we couldn't tell at times whether we were being slightly sarcastic and slightly tongue in cheek, or whether we were being completely vulnerable, romantic, and open hearted. Um, and the very story that the song is about swirls around that as well, where it's like. I can't tell if I'm joking or serious, but like, this is what's coming out. This sort of like very loud declaration of love. Um, and so that song is still one that makes me like laugh to myself when we listen down to it, which feels nice after all this time since making the song to still have an emotional response to it when we spin it. Right, right. So when you were you were recording the record in, uh, in California, right? In the record recording was kind of crazy. We were like split between over to like a bunch of different sessions. 
We did some sessions in Acton, Massachusetts with the producers in LA communicating right. through an app called Audio Movers. Right. We sent me and John over to Los Angeles and like potted up with the producers for a little bit to get like final vocals and guitar. It was an absolute like tapestry of like we need to get or not we need. It feels imperative on the inside to get this done. We don't know what else to do but finish this record. But to do that is going to be some serious logistical juggling. Uh, and that sort of informed the entire way the record came together. Right. So uh, you and the other members of the band, how was how did that affect how you had to perform, how you had to create? I mean, you know, I think that a lot of it sort of sounds like it'll come down to idioms. Like there's a lot of power in creating with enforced limitations. Right. Um, but also I don't recommend for anybody's mental health artificially, you know, putting those obstacles up just to do it. Um, I think that one thing that was apparent to us is that like, We've been saying that we make cathartic music, dance-oriented music for a while, um, but there's a big difference between playing music that is also meant to get yourself through a difficult time and like riding what feels like an easy wave and trying to pass on that feeling of ease to others. And I think the one thing that became very clear about a lot of this record is that like both in the instrumentation and like what the players are doing and in the lyrics, like this is music that we were singing to ourselves uh, right. and it very much successfully got up to the other side of a really difficult thing which makes us a little bit more confident that it might help other people do the same. Right. And with that in mind, you're starting to tour, aren't you, in a couple of days? Yeah, absolutely. You're catching me on the last day of production rehearsals in Ventura. Uh, so so what's that like? Right from Nick to How's it been? Howling our way through the sets. So what are your re rehearsals like? What's the vibe like? We've got the whole crew together. The stage is set up, and uh, we're just running through a lot of music that we want to feel very confident in when we bring it to the, the people that bought tickets. So right. it's a lot of just making sure everything sounds pristine, making sure all I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, we've got some new covers that we're very excited to debut. We've got some like little changes to some songs that we've had for a long time to right. the library for us. Um, and also, you know, we're just trying to reach into the catalog and make sure that anything that we want to play is at our fingertips. Right. Um, and yeah, just getting everything completely together. I feel like it's the kind of thing where I say production rehearsals and everyone looks weird. And then I say dress rehearsal because most people had some exposure to musical theater as a child. And right. I was like, oh, yeah, those things. Yeah. Uh, and you, you touched on covers. I see that you used, yeah, previously covered like kinks and things like that. So who, where do the ideas for the covers come from? Is it a band generated thing? Or are you the, the driver of that? And, and how does that no. discussion go? Definitely fully band generated. I think that it's about, you know, there's we spend a whole lot of time together, as I'm sure you can tell, even from just talking to one of us. Yeah. Uh, and it's a lot of just like the constant reigning of like, would this be cool? Would this be cool? That'd be kind of cool. That wouldn't be kind of cool. And I think that the two things that looking back at our sort of catalog of covers that draw us is a something that like we feel that our spin on could sort of bring into a more like cool view in our own mind mentality, whether that means making something more kinetic. I think with right. Loader by the Kinks, there's nothing we can do to improve on that subject matter. But right. we felt that maybe bringing it into a slightly more like body moving place just might shed a little bit of a different light on a song that already has so much like roots and history in the music. Right, right. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I see you, you covered Susudio. That could definitely use an update. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, and I will, I'm sure I'll take flack for this from some people, but like I'm in a huge Genesis Phil Collins phase right now. And, All right. Uh, and Genesis, both the Gabriel era and the Collins era, I think that both have a lot to say in terms of really good music. Right. Uh, I think they really got like, there's the only thing that I'll sometimes say is the, to the negatives, like some of their songs sound incredibly sonically dated. But right. if someone went in and like cleaned up and like, like deeply remastered all that music, like I was just playing throwing it all away on the drive up here. And like some of that stuff still like both in terms of subject matter and in terms of like production choices, it feels like it could have been made by somebody in their bedroom today, which I right. feel like can't be fit for a lot of stuff that actually topped the charts. Right, right, right. So, so with the two, what what is the? Do you guys interact with the with the fans after the two, after the shows? Is there much? Uh, what 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 is the high point for you of the 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 live thing? I mean, the whole experience honestly is really joyful to me, and I think that everybody in the band like it is the moment where most viscerally, like the thing that you make in a basement or a studio or by yourself connects with the people who decided they want to make a home for this in their lives. And right. I think that, you know, 
it's there are a lot of new pieces to this. This is our first tour on a bus. This is our first tour hitting these markets since like quite substantially before the pandemic. So like a lot of this feels very new. So a lot of it feels like I'll let you know in May once I get two nights of sleep after the tour and feel like a human being again. Yep. Um, but it is it is it all centers around the people, the people that have chosen to make this like something that they care about and to throw an increasingly high amount of money at like coming out to see us at their local venue. Um, and being able to interact with them both by playing the show and then hopefully by getting to say some hellos afterwards um, is always one of the most exciting parts of the whole gig, to be honest, much less the tour. Cool. And do you get outside of the U.S. much or are you, you kind of standing within the borders these days? So we're going to Toronto. I grew up in Toronto, so I'm the international member of the band. but only. Oh, yeah, because I, so I moved here from uh, Rochester, New York, which is just on the other side of the, the oh, old thank lake. You. Was Lilac Fest a thing when you were living there? We played of course. Lilac Fest the, yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Rochester, I, I will tell this story just because I, it's still one of the crazy things that he did unprompted. But we played uh, an event just right by the Museum of Play in that park. I forget what it's called. Um, and leading up to the encore, somebody threw a single on stage. And I just like am an idiot on stage sometimes. And I cracked a joke about how like this isn't enough money to get home. Right. And by the end of it, they'd thrown about three hundred dollars worth of singles at us, <laughs> and we literally like we were able to buy like dinner for the band on the city of Rochester. Nice and it one. Was truly, like, like we didn't ask for it. Really, we were joking about it afterwards. It's like, if you could make that happen every time, that'd be a game changing thing. But if you ever tried to do it on purpose, it'd be the most disingenuous thing ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the city of Rochester showed up very honestly and with bells on. And created this all-time story for us at the end of the show. That's that's very cool. Yeah, you're right. You you can't plan to do that, and you can't go. Well, this no, works. Let's do it again. <laughs> but that's so much of the fun for us is that, and like, and this is why it's sometimes hard to nail down. But that like living, breathing chaos where like you know it's probably going to go well because you've done it before, but still anything can happen, and right. your job is to kind of ride the wave that you're given. Uh, is incredibly exciting for us. Excellent. All righty. Well, it sounds like you're having fun. And you're probably going to have some more fun once you hit the road. So uh, enjoy oh, yourself. I got to lose this hair somehow, you know? You got, absolutely. Use it while you got it, I say. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thanks a lot for talking to me. And uh, just have a great time. I appreciate you. This was very pleasant, man. Thanks for your time. All right. Bye-bye.